And so when you do research based on what Black women did for ourselves versus what was done to us, you emerge with a totally different narrative through the lens of Black women because the stories that the aunties tell is always as if they're the masters, they're in control, they impose these things, and we're just too dumb to resist. This is something central to a woman's life, to her dignity. It's a decision that she must make for herself. From Kansas, Kentucky, and North Carolina, dedicated women marched. Abortion is fast becoming the new political fault line. Alabama's governor has signed the nation's strictest abortion ban into law. The Human Life Protection Act outlaws the procedure except when the mother's life is at risk. This bill is not about pro-life or the right to life. This bill is about control. We will not go back. We will not go back. And we, the people of the United States of America, documented or undocumented, are having abortions, legal or not. This court will never stop us. This is a crucial topic, but we'd like to start off by giving a content warning about this episode. We're going to be talking about sexual assault and reproductive coercion. Last week, we discussed the unknown history of women controlling their fertility throughout the ages, and specifically on this soil. That story isn't complete without discussion of the transatlantic slave trade and its connection to women's reproductive labor, then and now. I'm Kate Kelly, human rights attorney and activist. And I'm Jamia Wilson, writer, editor, and feminist activist. And this is Ordinary Equality. Back in 2002, I went to work at Planned Parenthood. A large part of what drove me there was it was important to pay respect to some of the things that my ancestors had experienced. As a person whose ancestors were forced to become property for others and to breed more property for others that could be stolen and sold away, I just knew that I could be putting myself to work to help prevent others from being forced to use their bodies in ways that they didn't consent to. That was something I fundamentally believed at my core needed to be changed. As soon as I learned about reproductive coercion, past and present, and how it's impacted Black and Indigenous women as a result of colonialism and slavery, my commitment to advancing reproductive justice deepened. I have a lot more to say about my experience with the so-called pink machine, which we'll dive into later this season. But my start in reproductive justice was intimately tied to the history we'll discuss today. I was introduced to the history of enslaved women's battle for reproductive freedom from a cherished professor and mentor of mine, Pamela Bridgewater. Professor Bridgewater was writing a book called Breeding a Nation. Tragically, she passed away before her manuscript made it to print. I was devastated at losing her, but what she taught me stayed with me all these years. She thoroughly opened my eyes to the realities of the founding of this country. She taught me that even though it's rarely mentioned in history books, the entire system of chattel slavery was propagated through control and coercion of the reproductive labor of enslaved women. Though she's now gone, her lessons stayed. She uncovered hidden history and put in a context that completely reframed our country's start for me. Thankfully, with the help of her widow, Kwaku, I was able to locate a DVD of a keynote speech Professor Bridgewater gave at Lewis and Clark Law School in 2012 on the subject. What I discovered is that there is a, it, it takes some digging, uh, but there's a very rich history to be unearthed and disclosed about reproductive slavery and its importance and some of the implications of having that lost chapter in our modern day discourse. Traditionally, historians have not focused on reproductive slavery. In fact, they in large part have overlooked uh, the sexual and reproductive exploitation of female slaves 
in the story of American history. It's just not there when you hear about it. I mean, when we talk about slavery, um, we talk about chains and bondage. Uh, we talk about forced labor. What we don't talk about is how the experience of slavery was very gendered for female slaves or enslaved women. And it's because of their sexual vulnerability or vulnerabilities to sexual abuse, as well as their reproductive capacities that made slavery a, a completely separate institution. And because of the difficulty in talking about sex publicly during the, the era after slavery, during the Reconstruction era, because of the unwillingness to embrace or to be held accountable for that history, uh, it just fell out of the definition of slavery. I think we should no longer accept an incomplete articulation of reproductive freedom by, on its own terms, incomplete, because we cannot understand freedom if we don't more fully understand slavery. And in particular, the extent to which our, both our freedom and our country's history in slavery or as a, as a culture built upon, made possible by slavery. Professor Bridgewater made the bold legal argument that constricting reproductive freedom, even today, is tantamount to slavery. Her argument hinged on the 13th Amendment, which bans involuntary servitude. She argued that because slavery depended on the slaveholder's right to control the reproductive capacities of women, that coerced reproduction was foundational to the institution of slavery. The only time this argument was ever used in court, it was met with a lot of pushback. But the history of reproductive oppression and its role in the enslavement of African people were a part of this country's inception. We know that the founding fathers were no strangers to this practice. Here's Professor Jennifer Morgan, chair of the Social and Cultural Analysis Department at NYU and a professor of history. She's the author of Laboring Women, Gender and Reproduction in the Making of a New World Slavery. And Jefferson, of course, is a slave owner, is a person who fathers children with an enslaved woman, is a person who also wrote extensively about his theories of racial difference and of racial hierarchy. Um, and I think that if you read Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia, you really begin to see how embedded the idea of enslavement was in the way that that he and his cohort thought about the future of the nation. They presumed slavery was presumed to be a natural and legitimate state. And part of what comes along with slavery is intimacy and or rape between slave owners and enslaved women. And that is simply, it's like one of many aspects of the landscape that Jefferson, you know, saw from his perch at Monticello. He understood those people as his property and property rights, as we know, are perhaps the most important thing about being an American citizen is the right to your property. Uh, so slavery was understood as something that fell under the rubric of your property rights. That rubric of property rights extended beyond adults that were kidnapped from another continent and sold. It also applied to the children born on U.S. soil. This broad application of property rights created hereditary racial slavery, which also served as another way to define whiteness. I've made an argument that that's part of the way that slave owners learn to differentiate themselves from those they enslave, right? That the children of enslaved people are always going to be enslaved. Um, that's the, the thing, that's the thing that race does. It differentiates this category of people and says, you are enslaved and you and your progeny are enslavable. So what that does is it makes the slave owner clear that his progeny are not enslavable. It's a, it's a way of understanding race and racial difference. In 1662, Virginia made a law that decreed that the enslaved status of a child is inherited through their mother, no matter who fathered the child. 
partis sequitur ventrum, or literally, offspring follows belly. Other colonies adopted this principle. Professor Morgan read from that act. Whereas some doubts have arisen whether children got by any Englishman upon a Negro woman shall be slave or free, be it therefore enacted that all children born in this country shall be held bond or free only according to the condition of the mother. So this law in 1662 in Virginia is the first law that says very clearly that the race of a child is uh, determined by its mother and that the status of the child is determined by its mother. It didn't matter who the father was for an enslaved woman. Her child was always already commodified, was always already marked uh, by either enslavement or enslavability. Founding fathers like Thomas Jefferson owned and even sold their own offspring. Because children born to enslaved women were a commodity to them, a way for slave owners and slave breeders to enrich themselves. Many have heard of Sally Hemings, a biracial enslaved woman owned by Thomas Jefferson. But few understand that she was actually his wife's half-sister. When his father-in-law died, Jefferson inherited Sally through his wife's estate. He became the father of her six children. Though Sally was promised their freedom, they never received it during Jefferson's lifetime. To reiterate, Thomas Jefferson enslaved his own children. Though history remembers Sally Hemings, she was not the only enslaved woman Jefferson impregnated. He saw this as a form of investment. Here's the recording of my late professor Pamela Bridgewater again. One of the primary proponents of the close of the international slave trade was Thomas Jefferson from Virginia. We all know Jefferson. We all think we know Jefferson. National security, his, his desire to close off routes from international trade routes, as well as his desire to facilitate the expansion of the territories west, really became integral to his second love, which was of the industry of slave breeding. He wrote journal articles and participated in conferences and symposia on acceptable practices for breeding slaves. One could increase property ownership by having no more than uh, the investment in a female slave. And if the slave owner was a man, the investment of his uh, semen. If a slave owner had limited funds sort of just starting out, the first purchase many of these uh, slave owners made was a female slave of reproductive age. Because then the, the amount of uh, return on investment, right, was exponential. And the investment fairly small, right? And so Jefferson practiced this liberally. For me, this really hits home. It's devastating to contemplate that I'm the descendant not only of survivors of slavery, but also of white slave owners who sexually coerced and raped Black women. When I think of my ancestors, the complicity of white enslavers, and the resilience of those they violated are both part of my history. Though this is a history I grapple with today, many white people I've encountered, including people I'm related to, are ignorant or reticent about this grisly past. And of course, men who were nefarious enough to sell their own offspring were not willing to give up any profits. The transatlantic slave trade was brought to an end at the insistence of slave breeders through the Act Prohibiting Importation of Slaves of 1807. It wasn't out of the goodness of their hearts or benevolent patriarchy, as some revisionists would lead you to believe, but instead because it cut into their potential profits. By outlawing an imports-based market, they created a booming domestic market. This way, only those already enslaved in the United States could produce more slaves, 
It's bone chilling to hear about my ancestors being talked about in this way. But the reality is that black people were treated like commodities and viewed as subhuman. Here's Professor Morgan. One might think that it's contradictory for slave owners in the American South um, and in the American North. Let's be very clear, there are still enslaved people in the northern states well into the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. So this is, uh, so some people might think it's contradictory or it's abolitionist even for slave owners to agree that that it's a that it's a reasonable thing to stop the slave trade uh, from from Africa. But there are a few things that we need to be mindful of. One is, uh, I mean, enslaved people are pushing back. They always are. And one of the things get, that gets associated with rebellion and revolt is being African born. 1807 is just a few years after the Haitian Revolution, which was understood correctly by many as being significantly impacted by the number of people who were enslaved on the island of Saint-Domingue who had been born in Africa, who were who were people who survived the slave trade. So there was a sense that Africans were dangerous, not that enslaved people whose rights you had taken from them were dangerous, but rather that somehow the danger lay in Africa. What happens after that is this massive secondary slave trade or internal slave trade, which is a trade from states like Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, into the Deep South, into Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Texas, et cetera. And that's, that is a moment of profound, um, until the start of the Civil War, like this profound uh, generational violence that happens to Black families who live under the threat or the experience of being sold away from their parents or their children or their family. The domestic slave trade changed significantly after federal law banned the import of enslaved people from Africa. Here's Professor Bridgewater again. Slavery was still legal and therefore, in order to replenish the slave population, reproduction became the only way to have more slaves. And one of the most startling things whenever I give these talks is that there were plantations in the mid-Atlantic region that ceased to engage in any other aspect of a slave economy beyond breeding. There was no criminal law, there was no law against uh, rape of a, of, of a slave, right? So it was impossible under the law for a female slave to say no. Once a woman was enslaved, not only was her labor owned by her owner, but access to her body, as well as the products of the sexual abuse. Subjected to horrific violence, increased forced reproduction, as well as the inability to keep their own families together, performing abortions and controlling reproduction became a form of rebellion for enslaved women. Loretta Ross, professor and godmother of the reproductive justice movement, who you heard from at the top of the show, has been researching this topic for years. You may remember hearing her talk about some of this history in last episode. Here, she talks about Margaret Sanger, who popularized the term birth control at the turn of the century and established what eventually became Planned Parenthood. And so beginning in the late 80s, I started working on this manuscript called African American Women and Abortion. That's when I discovered that the kidnapped and enslaved Black women who were brought over in the slave trade actually bought knowledge about contraceptives and abortive agents with them. And so they were secretly controlling their own fertility on these plantations. And where I discovered that was in the records of medical doctors who were brought in to try to investigate why the breeding women weren't breeding. <laughs> and even they said, they have some secret that we don't know about. And so Black women have been fighting for reproductive self-determination since our arrival in this country. I could argue that Black women were the forerunners of Margaret Sanger because yes. they were very intentionally doing fertility management as a way to survive slavery Long before white women said fertility management is a cause we need to work on, which only began with the Comstock laws. But that was hundreds of years earlier that they had been self-determining 
whether or not they were going to have children to enrich the slave economy. So we need to tell a whole new narrative that doesn't start with Margaret Sanger. I really want to validate her contributions, but calling her the mother of our movement, I think is a little bit historically inaccurate. I've even read stories of enslaved midwives that provided abortion services under slavery and all those kinds of things. And those things are just missing from most of the most of the books that are written about the women's movement and our engagement with reproductive politics. Direct accounts of resistance that Professor Ross is referencing are missing from the mainstream narrative, but they do exist. In his book, The Black Family in Slavery and Freedom, 1750 to 1925, author Herbert Gutman tells of a story of a confounded slave owner. The slave owner was wondering why six enslaved women, quote, of proper age to breed, had carried only two children to term over a period of 25 years. Many years later, he discovered that an older enslaved woman knew a remedy for pregnancy. She had administered it to the women on the plantation to bring about abortion. There are many direct accounts like this of enslaved women using knowledge and collective action to prevent and terminate pregnancies. My professor, Pamela Bridgewater, taught me that enslaved women actively resisted reproductive coercion through practices like abstinence, self-induced abortion, or even in some cases infanticide. This was all to avoid contributing to the maintenance of the slave economy. Due to the limited first-hand accounts, the prevalence of these practices can never fully be assessed. But a number of historians believe that many enslaved women engaged in these practices, and they were also performed by midwives in the enslaved community. For them, abortion was an act of resistance. Here's Professor Bridgewater again. But women primarily resisted slavery in the way that they experienced slavery. And that was in resistance to reproductive exploitation and sexual abuse. So by looking at the instances of resistance, one can get a sense not only of what this aspect of slavery was for female slaves, but also what their impulse towards freedom in this context looked like. Right. So when we start to think of ways in which to defy reproductive freedom, we can look to the resistance narratives right, to see in what ways these early examples of the pursuit of freedom look like. But reproductive coercion didn't end with slave owners. Enslaved women were also experimented on by the father of modern gynecology, Dr. Marion Sims. Every time I show up for my annual pap smear, I think of the pain 11 Black women, including Anarka, Lucy, and Betsy, who were the only three women Sims named, endured during his torturous operations. As a New Yorker now, I remember in 2018 when a statue of Marion Sims was removed from New York City's Central Park. Because of the violations of human rights he perpetuated on enslaved women in the name of medicine. It still boils my blood to think about the multiple monuments, including a women's dormitory erected in honor of this man in my birth city of Columbia, South Carolina. This is a man who said it was a, quote, dreadful mistake to give the Negro the franchise. Removing statues is a step in the right direction, but the legacy of the transatlantic slave trade and the domestic slave breeding industry has never left us. It's at the foundation of a system that continues to oppress and constrict female bodies, particularly Black bodies. Here's Professor Morgan's perspective on how the slave breeding industry is reflected in our current society. If the whole premise of hereditary racial slavery, it's, it's slavery that is passed through, that you inherit from your, from your mother, right? If you build a society that's premised on the commodification of certain women's offspring, then that commodification, if you don't do the work to undo it, it, it reverberates beyond the slavery period. The issue isn't like, well, 
there was a high value to enslaved children at one point, and then under freedom, how does that, how come you're not valuing black children anymore? Well, it's, when you put a price on something, then the price gets to become high or low, right? So part of what we're grappling with right now is the way that black women's children are devalued and are seen as excess and waste. And it's it's the most devastating it's to me it's the most devastating afterlife of this 400 year long system of hereditary racial slavery is the continued commodification the valuing and the devaluing of black children of black women's reproductive capacities and that's why when you move into the 20th century i mean who gets you know, where do pharmaceutical companies look to to experiment on birth control? They look to they look to poor people generally, but certainly they look to black women. Why do we see, you know, the increased uh, rate of black maternal mortality in 2019? It's because black life has been devalued for generations. And so, you know, a perfectly well-trained physician can walk into an obstetric room and presume that a black woman doesn't feel the same amount of pain as a white woman in childbirth and devalues her efforts to communicate to her doctor that something is wrong. All of that, like to, this is, this does not drop out of the sky from nowhere. This is about a multi-generational foundational moment that says that black women's children are enslavable, that black women's children are marked with a dollar amount. It could be high, it could be low, but that's, and that's what is different about black people in this country is that the family is never protected from the market. The market always exists inside the family. And of course the market is a place of incredible destruction and violence and dislocation. It still is. Keep in mind that as a nation, We've had slavery longer than the time we haven't. Slavery was legal in America from 1619 to 1865 when the 13th Amendment was ratified. That's 246 years. Slavery has only been abolished now for 156 years, 1865 to now, 2021. Given that context, it makes clear why this horrifying legacy still has tangible impacts today. Today, African Americans are the most likely group to lose pregnancies to miscarriage, stillbirths, or early infant death. For Black women in this country, the rate of miscarriage is 57% higher than it is for white women, and it's 93% higher after the 10th week of pregnancy. There's evidence that the root cause of this disparity lies in the stress that results from racism, and this specific stress is unique to African American women. Black women from Africa who immigrate to the United States have far better birth outcomes than Black women who were born in the U.S. In my family, we know this as a form of generational trauma. There are people who are working to combat this generational trauma and redefine what the reproductive experience can look like for women and other pregnant people, particularly people of color. One of those is my friend Latham. I know Latham through our shared literary, activist, spiritual, and wellness passions. It has been a blessing to know and work with such a transformative healer for years. She's a wellness leader and a master birth doula on the vanguard of transforming the wellness movement. There are doulas for many stages of the full spectrum of life, including abortion doulas. If that's a new term for you, here's Latham describing the work. When you may not be able to share with your family that you seek to terminate a pregnancy, you need to hold somebody's hand when you have to terminate a pregnancy that was very much wanted because it's not gonna end up in a viable birth. You need to hold someone's hand when you are a teenager and you are fraught with the choice between graduating and not having enough credits to finish school because you cannot finish your classes because you don't have the support that you need to get through the pregnancy, but you don't even feel good to go to school and there are no options for you. Much of what Latham shared with me was how misconstrued she finds the conversation around abortion. And if we could stop making it seem as if 
everyone is absolute in their decisions. Everyone is resolute in a choice that they would make. And if we could also start talking about it as if it's really choice, because what we're really talking about is a lack of choices. But the point is, is that the folks who are fighting for you to keep a baby are the folks who are also fighting to make sure that you don't have resources if that baby does go to term, right? They are fighting to make sure you don't have access to housing, you don't have access to education, you don't have access to to career opportunities and, and mobility. They're fighting to make sure you're disenfranchised. They're fighting to make sure that there's there's no health care for you. So it's interesting, right, that that there's this fight for life to the point of birth, but not when the child is here. I asked Latham about the fight over abortion access and America's history of slavery. I wanted to know if she saw the modern fight to deny women the rights to their own body as a continuum of that oppression. Um, Bloodshed is American as apple pie. I feel like I heard someone say something like this. Maybe it was Ta-Nehisi Coates. Yeah, bloodshed and and pain and trauma is, is what's been sort of embedded in this. When we think about the flag or you think about like a, a, a quilt, it's quilted right? It's quilted within the fabric of our society. In that, we think about the trauma that was passed down that lives in our tissues, but also we think about the idea of like bodily autonomy. It's fairly new, actually, for for Black people, um, specifically for Black women, to have actual control over their bodies. And we see the alarming Black maternal mortality rates in this country, which also We see the the same numbers for Native American women in this country, and we're reminded that this can happen to you, right? And so institutionally speaking, our bodies have been under attack. We have all the medical advances, and we know that economics do not protect us, education does not protect us. For any progress to be made, we have to acknowledge and then work to uproot and address the systemic oppression. And, and stopping the bleeding is really addressing this Black maternal health crisis in this country. It's looking at what's happening to Black and Native American women and not studying, talking to those people, talking to the folks who are saying these what's happening in their communities, what they're seeing happening in the hospitals, listening to them. We don't need more studies. We already know what's happening. We have enough statistical data. It's time to take action. You know, as we talk about reproductive justice and, and that using that as our lens to kind of move forward and advance, then we have to be thinking about the entire continuum and fighting for the entire continuum. It means fighting for access to abortion, safe and healthy abortion. It means fighting for access to safe and healthy birth. It means fighting period poverty. It means fighting, like it means all of these things, right? And so think about like where you can show up and understand that when we're talking about maternal health, we're talking about a human rights issue, right? This is not a woman's issue. I wish people would stop thinking like that or a black issue. This is a human rights issue and we need everybody's help. A huge part of this fight is telling and listening to the stories of Black women in this country who have been systematically subjugated by white slave breeders, biased doctors, and persisting white supremacy. What we haven't eradicated still haunts us today. The coercive reproductive control over Black women's bodies has a larger history, longer than our nation's government. That continuum Latham mentions is reflected in this country's devastating Black mortality rates in childbirth. The trauma has been passed on for centuries. The struggle for reproductive justice in America is inextricable from our struggle for freedom from white supremacy. That's a lot. (laughs) It is. It is a lot. I'm wondering... After learning all of this history and diving into the roots and how deep they are, how that makes you feel about your own lived experience now? It's really stunning to me because I think that when I, every time I go to a doctor's appointment, every time I need to tell my story to a doctor, I have a series of questions that I'm asking myself. Every time I go on ZocDoc to look at someone's reviews, I feel like I have to do extra legwork to make sure that I'm not only safe, but choosing someone who will be able to hold the complexities of how identity impacts our health and how the many different intersections of our lives and the history impacts our health outcomes. 
And I just feel that it can be exhausting and alienating to have that experience. And I've luckily over the years been able to find providers who I trust and who understand it or who are setting out to learn how to provide. But it's really been stunning for me to witness not only in my own experience, but in the experiences of my grandmother and my mother who endured reproductive related cancers and my own experiences with autoimmune illnesses and contemplating parenting myself, just the weight of knowing that I have to take steps and precautions. I think that it is really complex and I think that knowledge is power, but I also believe that we need to push for better policies to organize and to engage in patient advocacy because I also see that I have a lot of privilege and I have a lot of information about what questions to ask. I have been seen citing the research about the bias in medical care to doctors who haven't treated me and my loved ones correctly. I don't know that that's something that everyone's able to do or has access to. So I I just feel really committed to this work. And I also just believe that we need to really push for doctors to have more competency when it comes to the diverse communities that they serve. And again, all of this has to do with reproductive justice as a whole. And we'll talk about reproductive justice at length in a future episode. It's a crucial and fascinating movement. But before then, next week on Ordinary Equality, we're going to talk through how organized groups have crusaded against abortion, churches, and perhaps more surprisingly, how others have fought to maintain access. Ordinary Equality is a Wonder Media Network production, produced by Edie Allard, Grace Lynch, and Liz Smith. Our executive producer is Jenny Kaplan. Original theme music by Rachel Wardell. Special thanks to Janice Formicella and Taylor Williamson. This episode is dedicated in loving memory to Pamela Bridgewater. For too long, history lessons have glossed over the truly essential contributions women have made to history. That's where Encyclopedia Womanica comes in. This podcast from Wonder Media Network aims to change the narrative by introducing the pioneers, scientists, artists, and more from antiquity to today who have shaped our society. Every weekday, host Jenny Kaplan dives into the trials, tragedies, and triumphs of this diverse group of groundbreaking women. And the best part is, each episode is only five minutes long. The bite-sized episodes pack painstakingly researched content into fun, entertaining and addictive daily adventures you may or may not already know these women but you definitely should subscribe to encyclopedia womanica wherever you get your podcasts